Hello class. I'm going to give you a little presentation here on figures of speech, otherwise known as figurative language. Um, so uh, as you can see from my graphic, you uh, I mean, this is popular probably you know, four or five years ago where people would use, drop the word literally and uh, sort of indiscriminately. Uh, but what we're going to talk about is uh, is when you use language in a way that is is not uh, literal. So what's what is a figure of speech? Uh, so in, in a nutshell, this is a way of saying one thing in terms of something else, uh, which is designed to, to clarify, enrich, and or broaden our understanding of the things that they describe. So if we have an example from sort of everyday usage, a politician that supports military means and conflict resolution is called a hawk. Um, a politician, uh, conversely, that is in support of Peaceful means is known as a dove. Uh, so then we've heard of uh, an over-eager uh, over funeral director as being a vulture. Okay, so let's try some. So, and, and we'll stick with sort of the, uh, the animal uh, representation then of that uh, figurative device. So for a shy person, we typically are going to think of animals that are, are retiring, uh, reclusive uh, type things. So, uh, you might consider, say, a mouse uh, to describe a, uh, a shy person. Uh, someone who is, say, overweight, uh, obese, uh, we might call them a pig or a hog. Of course, none of us would because we are too polite for that. But um, anything that, that sort of references not only size, but maybe even the habits of, uh, of that particular animal. So someone who is slow, um, we might say, and, and this might be slow in, um, uh, you know, sort of movement, but also somebody that we would characterize as lazy. Uh, we might call them a slug or something of that nature. And then um, an assertive person, I'm sure you've heard uh, because you are all uh, overachievers. You've heard someone say, attaboy tiger or girl tiger. Okay, so so there you are using um, animals in place of uh, sort of as a, a vehicle for figurative reference. All right, so the two basic types, and, and I'm, I'm oversimplifying here, but um, just for our purposes, we'll think of it this way, uh, as simile and metaphor. So both things compare uh, elements that are ordinarily considered unlike each other, which is what makes the figure of speech work. And when I mean work, it's the idea that uh, an, an image is uh, is forming itself in your mind when you hear the figure of speech used in context. Okay, so the simile is your simpler of the two comparisons. Okay, because this is an explicit comparison between two things using typically like or as. Okay, um, so here's an example. News of the pop quiz was like a punch in the chops, as you can see from my graphic up there. Uh, now, here's here's where we want to think about it. Yeah, let's uh, the, the the news is surprising. OK, so we, we actually have some uh, uh, some figurative language embedded in my in my example. But the, the news, OK, is the thing we're talking about. And the punch in the chops is the point of comparison. Now, obviously, the, the, the psychic pain that might be uh, caused as a result of hearing that you're going to have a pop quiz in your class, particularly if you're unprepared, um, is in no way as, uh, as, say, damaging or hurtful as someone punching you in the face. Okay, now, pop quiz. So pop, why do we call it pop? Because like a balloon that explodes suddenly and is a startling uh, type thing, this is where we get the, again, the, the figurative reference to the pop, as in something that, um, that appears uh, almost out, out of nowhere. And then a punch in the chops. So the chops refers to a part of the face. It's here in the, in the jaw area. So if you, if you think about that uh, in reference to a cut of meat, like a pork chop or a lamb chop, something of that nature, you'll know that the, that the shape is similar. And so that's where we get the uh, that's where you get the term. Okay, so you can also say then, uh, news of the pop quiz was not unlike a punch in the chops. Okay, this is a more sophisticated way of, uh, of expressing it, and it's going to take the recipient 
uh, the person that's hearing it or reading it, uh, a bit longer to, uh, to make the reference because you've used the double negative. However, as with, with all this figurative language, the, the, the reader likes this because not only, again, does it enrich meaning, but it also is, uh, creates in the mind of the hearer and, uh, or reader a sense of surprise. We like to solve uh, puzzles and problems and things of that nature. And so when it dawns on you how the comparison works, um, often the, uh, the reaction is going to be something like mirth, okay? Um, because just like with humor, we laugh at things that are uh, either come as a surprise or out of a feeling of superiority. Okay, so either way, it's it's that uh, mental process at work. Okay, all right. So here here we're going to unpack the formal elements, sort of the rhetorical elements of uh, of a simile, and this works, by the way, for for any sort of uh, of metaphoric or figurative uh, exchange. So. 1937, I.A. Richards in his Philosophy of Rhetoric. And by the way, this is just one way of going through it, but it, but it seems simpler. Uh, we'll talk about another, another way of unpacking uh, figurative language uh, perhaps later in the semester. But for now, this will uh, be the simplest way of kind of looking at it. So he describes metaphor as having two parts. The first is the tenor. So this is the thing that you are talking about, the thing that you are describing. All right, so in my definition, the subject to which attributes are being ascribed. And then you have the vehicle, and this is the object whose attributes are borrowed. So in our earlier um, example of the news of the pop quiz being like a punch in the chops, then the tenor is news of the pop quiz. Not the pop quiz by itself, it's the news of it, okay? And then the vehicle is the punch in the chops, okay? All right, so here's another example. This tofu steak is like paper mache. All right, so this simile compares the steak, uh, the tofu steak here, to paper mache in order to make a point about the steak. Um, now, if you can't remember from your uh, from your childhood what paper mache is, this is um, you know if you if you recall, you might have blown up a balloon and then gotten strips of newsprint or some other kind of thin uh, paper. And then you have dipped it into uh, th this sort of uh, gluey, pasty type substance, and then you wrapped it around the uh, the balloon. When uh, when the material was wet, it would harden, and then it would take on the shape of the balloon. And maybe you made a you know mask out of it or or some such thing. Okay, so here the stake is the tenor, and the paper mache is the vehicle. However, I need to add one more element so that you are, are thinking fully, uh, sort of critically about how these, uh, how these devices work, okay? So the link between the two things, okay, the similarity between the first item, the stake, and the second item constitutes the third element, which is called the ground. So once again, and I hope you're taking notes, tenor, vehicle, and ground. So uh, you can anticipate that, that on uh, on assessments, uh, quizzes, things of that nature, I'm going to ask you uh, to identify the tenor, vehicle, and ground, or, or sometimes just uh, you know one or two of the of these elements, with respect to figurative language that is at play in the things that we're reading. And this is good practice for you to to go ahead and um, as you're reading, when you see an obvious example of figurative language, I mean the the simile is going to be the easiest thing for you to pick out then go ahead and do uh, this sort of uh, exercise uh, for yourselves. So the ground then is that the steak is tasteless and of glue-like consistency, okay? All right, so here we go. Uh, th this, is a, this is an extension of the simile and I'm calling it an implied simile. I really can't find out find what the, uh, the, the formal name for, for this is. I'm sure there is one, uh, but I've been unable to locate it and trust me, I've tried. Um, so here is making an explicit comparison between two things by degrees. And you'll hear this, uh, this quite often. So in my example, uh, it's hotter than the eighth circle of Hades out there today. Um, so here we're suggesting that one thing is greater or lesser than its point of comparison, okay? 
So now, what other vehicles might I use um, and to what effect here? So uh, the eighth circle of hell uh, or Hades, now I've got, I'm, I'm embedding something else in that, in that particular uh, simile, and that is a literary allusion. Do you know what my literary allusion is? Okay, it's to Dante's Inferno, who looked at hell as having nine levels, okay? So we're not quite down there in the, in the ninth level uh, with the three great betrayers, but, um, but there's, your, there's your reference. Now, I could use as a, as a vehicle, say, um, that it's hotter than a brush fire outside today, okay? Now, if I say that one, there's another one that I could use. It, it's hotter than a blast furnace out there today. Now, you want to take a look at, at, the, at the points of comparison, like the ground between those two things. So a brush fire, if you think about the characteristics, and this is where the ground comes in, is important for you to, to do the analysis. A brush fire is, as you probably know, something that burns hot at, at its source and moves fast. Okay, so then the suggestion is that the, that the heat is... Um, it's sort of a fast-moving, active type thing. To say it's hotter than a blast furnace, there's a different idea. Not only is it really hot, but the heat is condensed as it would be, you know, in, a, in an oven, uh, you know, some kind of uh, enclosed area, all right? So one is, is sort of burning hot, localized, and moving fast, and the other then is a, is a condensed heat, okay? All right, so now, uh, extended simile. So this is uh, this is much more unusual than an extended metaphor, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But here the tenor remains the same, while the vehicles employed vary, typically sequenced in a way that suggests a sense of amplification. Okay, um, And as I note here, in some cases, the vehicle itself then is amplified. Okay, So I'm going to give you an example from, uh, from Beowulf. And okay, so this, uh, this excerpt, is describing what has happened when a man, uh, a one brother has killed another accidentally. Okay, and in the in the culture of uh, of old English, uh, old Norse that we're talking about for for Beowulf, uh, if you kill another man or woman for that matter, you are expected to pay what's called the blood price, meaning that you exchange one life for another. OK, but because one brother has killed another. All right. The father does not want to exact that sort of blood for blood um, punishment. OK, so the feeling he has is this. It was like the misery felt by an old man who has lived to see his son's body swing on the gallows. He begins to keen and weep for his boy, watching the raven gloat where he hangs. He can be of no help. The wisdom of age is worthless to him. Morning after morning, he wakes to remember that his child is gone. He has no interest in living on until another heir is born in the hall now that his firstborn has entered death's dominion forever. Okay? All right, so now, second of the major uh, figurative elements is the metaphor. So this is a more complex uh, comparison, okay? So this is making an implicit comparison between two things, often suggesting that one item is the other item. So the tenor is the vehicle. Okay, so here's a simple example. You're at a party or you're out in your front yard uh, talking to your friend, and all of a sudden you see behind where your friend is standing, someone approach and you say, here comes the bulldozer. Now, in terms of the of the figurative comparison, I'm going to break this down a little further, as I. A. Richards did, um, and so he used a little bit of Latin here. So Edna, okay, is the primary point of comparison or the tenor. The bulldozer is the vehicle, and so the ground is something that is large built, flattens everything around it. Okay, so. The easiest of the two comparisons is going to be the, the physical characteristics. Okay, so without turning around, uh, when your friend says something about Edna being a bulldozer, then you might think of someone who is 
built like a bulldozer, uh, large belt flattens everything around her again because of sheer size and caloric intake and retention. Yep. Okay. However, the more complex process is going to be behavioral. And so what if you turn around and this comes walking across the lawn? Now, what is it then about this Edna that's different from the, the other uh, graphic representation of Edna? This one, we're talking about personality. Okay. So uh, th this woman here who is stalking out onto the, uh, uh, to the runway, we assume has the sort of uh, personality that, that takes, never takes no for an answer um, and just crushes uh, other people who are weaker than she is uh, in her wake. Okay. Does that make sense? All right. So there are different types of metaphors that we're going to, uh, to go into. These are the basic types, uh, extended, controlling, and implied. All right. So under the category of extended metaphor, so be thinking about what I said earlier about the extended simile. So now we're talking about a series of related comparisons. So uh, again, far more common than extended similes and a portion of a poem or, or say a passage from, uh, from prose. And this could be uh, prose fiction or prose nonfiction for that matter, depending on the subject matter, is going to be uh, organized around this protracted comparison. So here's Charles Wright's uh, poem called Pexatology, which is the study of sin. And so he says, as Kafka has told us, sin always comes openly. It walks on its roots and doesn't have to be torn out. How easily it absolves itself in the senses. However, in Indian summer, the hedge ivy star feet, treading the dead spruce and hemlock spurs, the last leaves like live coals banked in the far corners of the yard, the locust pods in Arabic letters right to left. How small a thing it becomes, nerve sprung and half electric, deracinated, full of joy. Because this is a, a super characteristic poem of, uh, of Charles Wright. Uh, he's won a Pulitzer Prize, uh, a National Book Award, uh, was the Poet Laureate of the United States for some years. So what you should notice here is that uh, the, the extended metaphor has to do with ivy, presumably English ivy, okay? And so you've got the, the idea of the walking on its roots. So if you know anything about how ivy uh, you know, sort of propagates and moves itself around, it will send out little light green tendrils, okay, that um, it, it's searching for another anchor point. And once it finds it, then it will lay itself down on the surface. So brick is, of course, a favored spot because there's all kinds of little nooks and crannies that it can grab hold of. And then it drops these little roots, okay? So if you think of like what a millipede looks like, uh, it looks like that. So those little roots, if you've ever had to pull um, ivy off of a wall, it's brutal. Not only has it, has it grabbed hold, but then you've got to like brush the, eye, brush the brick to get all those little um, white roots off there. It's a nightmare. Um, but you have that idea. And then you also have the hedge ivy star feet. So again, you've got that, that extended comparison of, of how the ivy is moving around. It's walking. So in one case, the, the, the sort of um, the stems have those feet that look like the, the millipede feet. And then the, uh, the, the ivy leaves themselves look a little bit like, you know, duck feet or, or some other kind of, um, you know, appendage. So, so this is dawning on you as you're reading it. Okay. Um, another, another marvelous uh, reference here is that the locust pods, if you've ever seen what locust pods look like, they're sort of, um, when they drop, they, they turn a dark brown, kind of this uh, burnt umber color, and they're uh, they're long and sort of sweeping, but then they curl and so forth. So if you've ever seen them scattered on the ground, like at Shelby Farms, if you go over there, uh, they got a bunch of locust uh, trees that are that are up uh, up from the uh, the visitor center along that tree line, and when they drop, then they they sort of scatter, and it looks like you know Arabic writing. It's, it's quite a I mean this is just a marvelous image. Uh, on the part of Charles Wright then. Okay, so now a controlling metaphor is different than an extended metaphor because here the comparison is at work throughout an entire poem, okay, or it serves as the organizing structure for the work at hand. So the example I'm going to read for you 
is Building an Outhouse by Ronald Wallace. Uh, another good example is um, uh, She Being Brand, a poem by E.E. E. Cummings, which he is implicitly comparing um, the, the driving of a new car. So when Cummings wrote this, this is when, uh, when cars, you had to break them in. Okay, and they were they were hand cranked. You would crank the, the the front of the car to get the engine started. Uh, he's comparing that to, uh, to to dealing sexually with a virgin. Okay, and so uh, look that poem up. It's it's uh, it's marvelous. And here's what happens in the mind. If you think of it, so when I used to read this to students, um, if you read it and are only thinking about the car, okay, then in your mind it's working, but then. When you realize, gee, this could be about something more than just a car, and when you start to think about the fact that it is about a sexual encounter uh, between potentially two uh, two young virgins, then then the poem just utterly opens up and expands in terms of its uh, of its meaning. So this one that I'm going to read you by uh, Ronald Wallace is similar. Okay, so he's comparing writing a poem to building an outhouse. Building an outhouse. So in this case, the 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 title is the, is the first line. It's the launching point for the poem. So building an outhouse is not unlike building a poem. The pure mathematics of the shape, the music of hammer and tenpenny nail, a floor joist, stud wall and sill, the cut wood's sweet smell. If the skill saw rear up in your unpracticed hand, cussing, hogging its chaw of dust, and you're lost in the pounding particulars of fly rafters, siding, hypotenuse and load, until nothing seems level or true but the scorn of the tape's clucked tongue, but the nub of your plain-spoken pencil prevail, and it's up, functional, tight as a sonnet. It will last forever, or at least for a while, though the critics come sit on it and sit on it. So if you take a look at this, uh, so if you stop the video um, and, and look at it, you'll see all those marvelous elements, especially if you write poetry yourself, you'll see all those elements that are... Uh, that are comparable between the two enterprises. And he's got the, and, and the nice rhythm and music in this particular poem with all these um, uh, all these acoustic devices that work together. So this is gonna be the next uh, presentation that you're going to take a look at is one that, that deals with sound devices or acoustics in poetry. Uh, so it's just a lovely little poem. All right, so implied metaphor. And so all the stuff that we're gonna be talking about uh, going forward is this sort of idea where uh, the, the, the comparisons are not made by using like or as, okay? So again, doesn't explicitly identify one thing with this comparative thing. So this is explicit, like a mule Jack dug in. And you'll notice here that I have, I've inverted the normal order of the simile, because normally you would say tenor first and then vehicle, yes? Jack dug in like a mule. By inverting the, uh, the order uh, of words here, by playing around with the syntax, I've, I've essentially created a, an even more sort of surprising um, encounter uh, or experience in reading for, uh, for my audience, okay? Now, Jack was a mule standing his ground. Okay, so that comparison is, uh, is pretty easily made, but this is a delightful implied comparison. Jack brayed his refusal to leave. All right, so, so here, Jack is the tenor. The mule, or donkey, um, is going to be your vehicle. And then now, what's the ground? Well, the ground is, is something, you know, generally an animal, that is, is stubborn. Uh, it is hard to move when it has made its mind up. Okay, so a way that you can think about this if you are, uh, if you're going to write poetry in which you want to make an, an implicit comparison of this sort, then think about the uh, the sounds that animals make. Okay, so I might say that the um, uh, the, the seventh graders yelped and complained about the uh, uh, news of the test next Friday. Okay, so what kind of things yelp? Well, I mean, squirrels don't yelp, rabbits don't yelp. So it's typically some kind of, uh, we think of a, of a dog probably. In the same, the same vein, um, you might say that the seventh graders howled in protest at the uh, news of the test next Friday. So again, what kinds of things howl? Uh,
cats generally, you, know, you think of them as like yowling. We don't think of them so much as howling, but they, you know, you might say that they do. But generally, we think of howling with respect to canids of some sort. So dogs, wolves, uh, coyotes, this sort of thing. All right. Hope that makes sense. All right. So other figures that we're going to cover here, metonymy, synecdoche, personification, hyperbole, understatement, paradox, and kenning. Kenning is important because it's going to be, uh, it's, it's rare that we see this uh, in its natural habitat other than at, uh, in, in sort of uh, the, the poems like Beowulf that we're going to read. Okay, so metonymy. So I'm going to give you a lot more information on this because this is, uh, you're really going to need to bear down to, uh, to, to learn this kind of thing. And you're going to have to look for it in your reading, but you're going to see it everywhere. Trust me. Okay, so it's from the Greek for change of name. So meto, okay, meaning change, and nimi, meaning name. Okay, so change of name. So as a rhetorical figure, then, it falls under the category of subject and adjunct. If you have an interest, by the way, in, um, in some of the more technical elements relative to, to this presentation, I urge you to go to the, um, uh, the Brigham Young University uh, rhetoric site. It's uh, like byu.edu, and it's the... Um, it's Silver Rhetorica, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right because I, I never took Latin, but it is the most extensive site out there on the web for, uh, for, for scholars of rhetoric. And it's just got every figure you ever thought about and hundreds more that you never even considered. On the right-hand side of the, um, of the opening page is all the figures, and there are hundreds of them. Okay, and metonymy is one of them. All right, so... Metonymy replaces the subject for its characteristics, okay, or their characteristics. We've got a, um, uh, a plural uh, of some element, okay? And then the other way that it works is it replaces the characteristics for its subject. So let me give you some examples. Replaces the subject for its characteristics, okay? And, and you're thinking of, of tenor and vehicle here, yep. So... Fred was a jock in high school. Okay, I'm sure you've heard this, this expression uh, used before. And instantly, what, what should have come to mind, unless you've been living uh, in a closet for, um, for most of your lives and never heard this uh, sort of expression, is that Fred was what? A violin player? Uh, a guy who painted or sculpted? No, of course not. He's a guy that engaged in athletics. So to break down how this thing works, and it's quite marvelous, a male athlete often wears an undergarment designed to protect his genitalia from injury via impact or violent movement while playing sports called an athletic supporter. Okay, so even that is a euphemism because we don't want to uh, necessarily uh, get more, you know, sort of anatomically graphic than that in polite company. Um, so we're just going to call it an athletic supporter. Although I don't think that, uh, even, like, okay, I can't believe I'm going to tell you this. Like when I was in high school and played soccer and stuff, like the shorts didn't have like an inner liner. So you had to wear one of these things. I mean, you just did. And, and, and all kinds of athletes, uh, male athletes in particular, uh, the, the women's equivalent, I suppose, is the sports bra. Um, but basically everybody wore these things. Okay. And if you played baseball, for sure you wore one with a, you know, a plastic cup in there uh, because nobody wants to get a, uh, a line drive. Uh, to the uh, athletic supporter region. Okay, so this garment is also refer referred to as a jock strap. Now, where'd you get that name from? Because jock is the slang, the British slang term for the penis, and thus a jock strap is a metaphoric term for someone who wears an athletic supporter. Get rid of the that sort that's that's shortened to simply a jock. Okay, jock strap. Up to jock. Fred was a jock in high school. All right. Kind of cool. All right, here we go. Next one. Replaces the subject for its characteristics. Okay. But also then we have replaces characteristics for a subject. So here, the injured boy held up his hand as if to keep the life from spilling. All right. So life stands in for what? For blood. Okay. As, as you read you know, literature of all kinds, poetry in particular, and if we're, you know, so uh, this is being made semi-specifically for uh, classes getting ready to read Beowulf, 
you're going to see uh, metonymy used all the kind all the time. Metonymy is used quite often in religion. For example, okay, instead of saying God, you often hear what? Heavenly Father. Okay, that is metonymy right there. Okay. All right. So synecdoche. So we got metonymy, change of name, and then synecdoche, which from the Greek is receiving jointly. Okay, so um, here a part stands for the whole. Uh, so a uh, former colleague of mine uh, had this little um, goofy rhyme that was, um, if it connecticky, it's synecticky, right? So it's a part for the whole in one of four ways. So here's the first way, general for specific, all right? Here comes the law. So what do I mean by that? I mean, probably a, a, an officer, okay? Uh, you might say a cop. Um, has shown up, and I'm not going to unpack that one because I'm, I'm, I can see my timer. I'm running. Uh, I'm running over on time, but this refers to a police officer. Okay, general for the specific, the law. Police officer upholds, you know, the laws of the land and so forth. And so now we're going general to the specific, an, an individual. Um, then we've got the specific for the general. John is a cutthroat in the fourth quarter. So what do we mean by that? That that a cutthroat is a type of murderer. Okay, we wouldn't want to say serial killer because the the, the condensed nature of the fourth quarter, uh, it doesn't you know it doesn't work like that unless John say as a uh, say he's a cornerback in football or something and over the past uh, you know six out of the last eight games he has made an interception, uh, run it back for a touchdown that has won the game for his team. Now you could say that John is a serial killer in the fourth quarter. Okay, does that make sense? All right. So now part for the whole, and this is one that you're, you should be really familiar with. How about giving me a hand with this box? So I don't mean we're going to lop the lop your hand off at the wrist and um, and toss it over to your buddy. Rather, we're talking about your hands. I need to to hold the box, but I need your entire body uh, to to help me move this. Uh, you know, uh, unwieldy thing that, uh, or, or super heavy thing that I'm having to deal with, okay? And then the other way is the material for the object made from it. So here he refused to help his own flesh and blood. So meaning relatives, people that are related uh, again by, you know, genetically, but here uh, by flesh and blood, okay? All right, now, how do they differ? All right, so let's see if we can unpack this. Synecdoche is always part of the whole, always, okay? Whereas metonymy may be outside of or merely associated with the reference in question. And let me tell you something. You're, you're going to have to just, you're going to have to practice this. So while you're reading, you should be writing this stuff down. Where, wherever you notice something that might be uh, metonymy or synecdoche, look at it. Apply the uh, the standards that you have learned here in this delightful presentation to the, the times when they make an appearance, and you should be able to, with practice, figure this out really easily. Okay. So here's an example from uh, Michael Lewis's uh, nonfiction novel called Moneyball. In 2001, Billy Bean, general manager of the Oakland Athletics, stocked up on arms. Okay, so. When he stocked up on arms, there's even the implied metaphor there relative to stocking up, okay? But stocking up on arms means what? Pitchers, okay? So this is metonymy because the speaker means pitchers and arms stands for pitchers, okay? Now, if I say that that particular pitcher has a live arm, I'm not speaking merely of the thing uh, that that's attached to the to his trunk uh, and attached to the hand that has the the ball in it. Okay, so this is synecdoche because the speaker means the pitcher throws the ball fast, and, and it might even have some movement as well. It probably does, which he does with his whole body, not just his arm. Okay. All right. Awesome. All right. So here's some other figures to consider. Common ones: hyperbole. Right? Well, no hyperbole is another name for exaggeration. So, why are you always late? 
Okay, now the fact of the matter is that, uh, so this, uh, this agitated man uh, in my graphic uh, is making this, um, uh, this, this claim. Whoever it is he's talking to is not always late. But the use of the hyperbolic always, and then it's, it's, in, it's in the same sort of category as never, uh, everything, nothing, all, any, any extremes that you have, you, you're going to put in the category of hyperbole. Okay. Any, again, anything that seems extreme or exaggerated is going to be identified then as hyperbole. And if you'll think back about the, um, about the similes that I used early on in our, our presentation about it being hotter than a brush fire out there, that's obviously hyperbole in addition to being that implied simile that I talked about. Okay. All right. Next example is going to be understatement. So on Steph Curry scoring 73 points in a game, um, you know, Steph might say this about himself or, uh, or me being a, uh, a devotee of, uh, and, and, and huge fan of Steph Curry, I might say, yeah, a pretty good night. Okay. Great example of understatement. Okay. So if you've got a, um, a team that goes undefeated, um, yeah, they had a good season or yeah, they're a pretty good team, right? So you're making a point about it in a way that then it allows the hearer to uh, the, the and this is also an example of irony for that irony to uh, to dawn on them. OK. All right. So personification. Now, personification is a situation, again, figurative. Device. Where you're lending human qualities to abstractions and inanimate or inanimate objects, animate or inanimate objects. So, um, you know, this is also known in, in some circles as like anthropomorphism, where you give human traits to um, uh, to animals. But personification, again, giving human attributes to something non-human. All right. So it's designed to evoke an emotional response. OK, so here in uh, in this poem by Charles Simic. Called late September, uh, one of the lines is it was only the sea sounding weary. OK, so it's not possible for uh, you know, even even animals, we tend not to associate with weariness, uh, it, that, which is different than being tired. OK, so tired is uh, typically we think of that as a discrete event, whereas weariness has has a temporal quality to it. It, it, it goes on and on. It's the result of, of being tired over and over and over again. OK, all right. Now, animation is is similar to personification, except here this is lending non-human qualities to abstractions and inanimate objects or humans. OK, so when I said that um, uh, John braid his refusal to leave uh, to leave, so that that implied metaphor is a perfect example of animation. OK, hope that makes sense. All right. So this is designed to evoke a sense of the non-human or animalistic. So if I'm, I'm making, say, a um, uh, I mean, and this is not a favorable comment on that on that person if I'm comparing them implicitly to uh, to an animal or something of that nature. OK, uh, so here we'd say with the finish line just ahead, he reached for the line clawing at the air. I guess we know that people don't have claws, uh, they have fingernails, but we are turning this uh, the subject of this comparison into, you know, some kind of, uh, of animal, um, you know, maybe a bear. Or, or something like that in the uh, um, in the nonfiction novel I referenced a minute ago called Moneyball. There's a, a scene where where Michael Lewis refers to Billy Bean as uh, as busting out a can of Copenhagen and clawing out a dip of snuff. OK. All right. Paradox. Paradox. So uh, from the Greek for contrary to expectation. So it tells its truth through self contradicting a self contradicting assertion in the whole of its meaning or an assertion of strange quality that contradicts common belief. All right. So the idea cowards die many times before their deaths. Um, you know, a, a courageous man, but once I think is the is the next, is the follow on line. But that's so that's paradoxical because. I mean, we're mortal, right? So so human beings, once you're dead, you're dead. You know, we're not talking about necessarily the, the sort of spiritual afterlife here. We're talking about like the literal body dying. OK, but here the death is um, 
the, 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 in the, the first verb there about die means that they are suffering from, uh, from something, the shame and so forth of their cowardliness uh, over and over, you know, many times before their physical body is, uh, is no more, okay? Now, oxymoron is a specific type of paradox, okay? And this then is by linking opposites and contradictory attributes that result in the paradox. So some good examples of that, um, and, and again, we're talking about it's a two words, oxymoron is a two word paradox. So you would have like a thunderous silence or jumbo shrimp. Okay, so you've probably heard things like this. So anytime you, you see a two word paradox, uh, you're thinking oxymoron. Okay, now this is the last slide. Thank God. Okay, so um, I mean, for you, I, I, I could do this all day. Uh, so kenning. So kenning is from the Old Norse, kenna, meaning to perceive or to name. All right, kenning is, um, it, I mentioned this at the beginning of the presentation, we typically um, associate this with kind of Old Norse, um, Old English poetry, all right? So in Beowulf in particular, Beowulf is littered with Kenning, okay? And you'll, you'll see it all over the place. All right, so here it's a phrasal figure of speech in which two words, occasionally more, are yoked, okay, put together in order, see what I did there? You got the uh, there's the implied metaphor about being yoked. We all know what a yoke is, right? Something you put on a uh, on an animal. Uh, typically, you, you yoke two oxen together and they pull a uh, a cart or something, right? Okay, yoked in order to form a conventional reference to a person, place, object, or office or like job. Okay. So it's a common device in the poetry of primitive cultures. Uh, Kenning is often a concrete juxtaposition that stands for a more abstract term. All right. So here's an example. You're going to see this in um, the first one. You're going to see in uh, Beowulf. So a wave traveler is a ship. Okay. Now, if we go into more contemporary um, usage, okay, a curtain climber is a pejorative reference to a crawling infant. Uh, what, what might be another uh, term that you would use? How about rug rat. Okay. So. We still use these sorts of, uh, of devices, although, you know, nobody's going to say, oh, that's a nice Kenny you just used there. I mean, because hardly anybody knows that, uh, that this is a thing. Okay, but you do. And that is, um, uh, that's what matters. So expect to see, the, see me ask questions like this on, uh, on assessments. And I'm asking you to practice uh, in your use uh, of these things. So if you have any questions about this presentation uh, or anything else that you have uh, been exposed to uh, in this class, just let me know.